Another ethical issue is the claim that this had to be done because without this, they would have had to have fought, continue fighting with Japan and lives would have been lost. So there's this harm reduction argument that's made also. I don't think it really debunked it. It sort of presented that as the obvious position and didn't spend any time with other possibilities. Uh, so it's one of my irritations with okay. it. It's what I call the, the bomber invade narrative. Yeah. And that was a specific narrative that was sort of created by the people who used the bomb after the fact. It does not reflect how they thought about it in 1945. They did not see bombing and invasion as mutually uh, 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 incompatible. They were sort of doing everything within their hands. They were surprised the war ended when it did. General Groves didn't think two atomic bombs would end the war. He thought it would take many more atomic bombs. Like they were all kind of, uh, uh, elated, but they also was that was not the only options on the table. Uh, they knew the Soviets were going to invade. They knew that would have a big impact on the Japanese. The admirals also advocated many of them a uh, they called a blockade strategy, where you basically just cut them off and just wait for them to starve and give up. I'm not saying that's better or worse. I'm just saying they also knew, and this is not shown in the movie. Uh, they had intercepted communications between the Japanese and their ambassador in Moscow, and they knew mm -hmm, the Japanese mm -hmm. were uh, not ready for unconditional surrender, but had a faction within their government who were considering a conditional surrender. They wanted to preserve the emperor. And that's not the same thing as a peace offering. They, the Japanese definitely ha were not there. But the point is just that, like, this narrative of, like, fanatical Japanese, we have to do this horrible invasion, we're going to lose huge inflated, huge numbers, which, as an aside, are not the numbers Truman was given or anybody was talking about at the time, but, like, or we use the bomb. Like, this is a false dichotomy that has deliberately constructed to make it seem like there's no better option than using the bomb. And you can deconstruct even the using the bomb part. I like to call it two bombs on two cities in three days, because that highlights like there's a lot of little variables there that you could imagine being different. One bomb, maybe not a city, maybe more than three days between them. I don't know. Right. If your goal was preserving life, which it wasn't, which is the big historical point, that was not the goal. <laughs> and so all these justifications are to a false end and you can like the bombings or not. But I'm always like, please don't justify them based on false reasons. Right. And if like a couple, I mean, yeah, I agree, again, I agree, agree with all of that. And like one particular thing, and again, maybe this is getting a little too like in the weeds, but like, I think it like, in terms of something that like, you know, frustrated me as a historian, but this idea that like, it took two bombs and they knew in advance that it was going to take two bombs. I believe that's mentioned on two separate occasions in the film. Mm. In any case, there is at least one, even if it's not two, there's a moment where Groves, uh, the Groves character, Matt Damon's character, doesn't just mention two bombs, but explains the rationale. Once to let them know they have it, we have it, and once to let them know that we're going to keep using it. And that um, that flies in the face of like all recent scholarship on this, right? Which is that, you know, um, and I mean, the... Um, or virtually all recent scholarship on this. And that was such a striking moment to me because that felt like a directorial choice to, I want to embrace yeah. this narrative, even though mm -hmm. things that Nolan must have read in preparation for this must have debunked that. Mm -hmm. Right, but yet he goes with it. It's funny. I don't know if it was a choice. I mean, I I constantly go back and forth and the, whether this was a choice or whether it's Nolan it, 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 inserting pre-held beliefs mm. without realizing it, without realizing that that's not yeah. what the scholarship has been saying for like twenty years. Right, right. like it's not new. And it's because it's such, it's sort of part of the air that Americans breathe is like that version of the decision to use the bomb thing. And it's very hard to get people to realize that that's not, it's actually much more interesting and complicated than that. I think I would agree with you on that, given the power of that narrative, except that I think he was so good at giving 
tiny little shout outs yeah. to various his like the Franklin yeah. one, right? Yeah. He didn't need that narratively, but that's in there, right? And there's any number of other things yeah. that convince me that he did his homework, right? And that he or somebody on his staff probably read a lot. And so I guess I'm a little less willing to give him a pass on it was just the narrative he inherited and he didn't encounter the scholarship. I don't, I don't give him a pass either way. Like I'm just saying. Yeah. 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 But it seems to me like it was just a hundred percent. I mean, cause Chris Nolan does do his homework and there's no way he didn't have a huge team of researchers and historians. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, but so it was maybe just another dramatic choice in how he, how he teed up the narrative. And I don't, I don't remember from the film and maybe you guys, for me, I can't remember how much um, was said about the Japanese tenacity argument because that was so pervasive in the arguments for using the bombs at the time, you know, that you, they would fight to the last man. And then, you know, Stimson came out with his article, you know, after, you know, in 1947s, you know, laying out the official position um, in terms of why we had to use the bomb. We had no choice. And, you know, he offered up all kinds of stats saying that they, there were still 5 million people in the Japanese army. There were still 5,000 suicide aircraft. And, you know, and the implication was is that they would be used no matter what, unless they were bombed to hell. I mean, first of all, guess what? They were already bombed to hell. I think, you know, they, they'd been yeah. 67 cities, I think, had been completely yeah. incinerated by, by just conventional fire bombing. So, I mean, that country was already like a wasteland of ash for the most part. Most part. Um, you know, and secondly, you know, the, the statistics that were, were, were brought out to the American public at the time were knowingly wrong. And it, it all, again, came back to them peddling, you know, this very racist ideology of, you know, Japanese tenacity. Again, you know, that it was going to cost us a million lives, American lives, if there was a land invasion that fall. Um, and then there was even some magnanimity thrown in there, you know, that the bombs had not just spared these these million lives, but it had spared Japanese lives. They'd saved them from themselves in a way right. by incinerating Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you know, so I just I can't remember how much that was was uh, brought out in I, in I, the film. And I, but I just would say most of that stuff, like the Stimson, that's after the fact. And that to me is, as a historian is really important because like that becomes the narrative for what we were thinking about when we did it. Mm -hmm. And that the record base does not back that up, that that's what exactly. they're talking Maybe they thought, but they didn't talk about it. And so, we, and even the numbers, like when Truman is meeting to talk about the invasion, the admirals and the joint chiefs of staff, they're quoting him numbers like 40,000 people, exactly. which is not nice. But there's a big difference between 40,000 and a million, right? Like, and Truman himself would start to say 500,000, which is a number he just made up. And then he would later start to say a million later in his life. And this is feels like very inside baseball. But the point is that this was not really the terms in which they thought about it in 45. They thought about it in lots of complicated, interesting terms. There's a lot going on there. And the Oppenheimer approach to it, which is, is a, to go back again to what Leslie was saying, like this fear of the future, like my sense of why Oppenheimer wants to do this, aside from the fact that he's professionally invested in the whole thing, which I think can't be too underestimated, uh, uh, is the worse you make the first use of the atomic bomb, the more likely, in his mind, you get the positive outcome of the whole thing, which is no more world wars, maybe no more war, right? And if the first atomic bomb is not impressive, if it isn't horrifying, then people think, oh, it's not a big deal. And then you have hydrogen bombs, which they are already thinking about. He's already thinking, they're thinking about 100 megaton bombs at Los Alamos yeah. in 45. They are doing calculations for how many hydrogen bombs you'd need to set off to make the world too radioactive for human inhabitation. And their calculation, which is fortunately much lower than reality, is between 10 and 100 which is like not that many bombs. Like they thought it would need 10,000 World War II atomic bombs to make that much radiation, right? Like that's, and so they're really like, this is what, this is what I mean in the, my piece where it's like, he's afraid of that. For yeah. Killing people at Hiroshima, that's, that's not great. But if that saves hundreds of millions of lives. Yeah. Now I'm not saying he's right. I'm just saying that's more that of like an argument from 45 yeah. and not from 46, right? right. Like there's a, such yeah. a difference between yeah. how this gets talked about by these people over that short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's important to 
like you know, as you were saying that like his we, we shouldn't underestimate his professional investment in this, right? I think that's right. And so it's not and it's not just personal pride, but he's he's at the he's at the intersection of a lot of different competing interests, all of whom he wants to either impress or get approval of, or in some cases both. And the 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 general growth relationship is really interesting because like Oppenheimer, I mean, from the perspective of like the security team, Oppenheimer is compromised, right? I mean, like, like, like Oppenheimer mm. is somebody who, who is, owes his position, you know, as director to, um, to Grove and others being willing to overlook certain things in his past. I, I, I'm not saying personally that things in Oppenheimer's past were bad, but, but the security regime judged them to be bad. So Oppenheimer is just also not really in a position where he can contradict, right, what Grove wants to any significant degree, right? He, maybe he can moderate it, right, or, or suggest other things. But if anyone was going to be a serious counterweight, right, to, to Grove's or Grove's allies on the interim committee, it wasn't going to be Oppenheimer, right? He just wasn't, mm -hmm. where he was personally and institutionally just would not have allowed him to, like, do that, even if you wanted to, which I don't think he wanted to.